This is TV18 and you're watching CNBC TV18. Minister Nirmala Sitaraman's maiden budget has laid out a roadmap for the Indian economy to touch $5 trillion by 2025. The budget's focus on fiscal consolidation has been welcomed and the emphasis on driving infrastructure spending and unlocking value via disinvestment have been given a thumbs up. The government's tax proposals, including the additional surcharge on the rich, the tax on buybacks of listed shares have caused some heartburn. Aside of tax-related issues, the big move to recapitalize banks and a one-time six-month guarantee to PSU banks to buy pooled assets of sound non-banking financial companies or NBFCs promises to reduce the credit stress in the system and open the liquidity tap for corporate India. So on this special edition of Eye on India, we discuss the fine print of Budget 2019. I'm Shireen Bhan and joining me on the program, Sudhir Kaparia, partner and national tax leader at EY and Abhizar Divanji, leader of financial services and restructuring at EY. Gentlemen, appreciate you joining us here on the show. Uh, as I pointed out, uh, there is a road map and a vision that's been laid out by the finance minister to convert India to a $5 trillion economy. But before we get into the specifics, one of the key concerns that uh, we are going to address are the tax-related proposals of uh, the finance bill. Now, one of that has specifically to deal with the tax on FPIs. Uh, the surcharge will be imposed on FPIs. In fact, it's not just FPIs, but any indeterminate trust, whether it's foreign or domestic. This is something that uh, soured sentiment in the stock markets as well. Let's hear our finance minister, Devmala Sitaraman, who has spoken on the surcharge issue. Issue. Speaking with the media after her post-budget meeting with the Reserve Bank Board, the finance minister believes that a clarification at this point in time perhaps is not needed. However, if a clarification is warranted, she may speak on the issue in Parliament. I don't think uh, clarification at the moment is all that required. Let's see as it goes. You think it's required? <laughs> We take it as a uh, FPI, uh, fundamentally investors have raised certain concerns on the higher surcharge in the budget. Uh, what would be your view on that? I don't want to sound uh, uh, too uh, much of a stickler for rules, but uh, probably this is a question which I will probably uh, have to answer in the parliament too. The session is on and therefore I'd rather do it if I have to do it in the parliament rather than saying it out now. Well, that is the finance minister addressing the uh, uh, issue that has uh, soured sentiment in the markets. Well, let me go across to our uh, panelists here, Sudhir Kapadia and Abhizar Divanji. Mr. Kapadia, let me start by asking you about what you make of this controversy. Uh, now, we have uh, Mr. Ranjan, a member of the CBDT, basically saying that, uh, uh, you know, why are FPIs coming through the trust route, whether this is the government's way of trying to plug any loophole there, uh, we don't know. But they also see seem to suggest that they are open to examining this particular issue. How do you look at the imposition of the surcharge on trust structures and what it means? So I think, uh, Shireen, a couple of points. My personal view is uh, that uh, I don't think this was intended uh, because if this was intended, I'm sure uh, in, in such a long uh, speech and afterwards a lot of interviews were given from the government side. Uh, this would have been specifically mentioned. So my personal view is that this has come as a consequence of simply levying the surcharge on what I would call uh, non-corporate. So it includes individuals, it includes association of persons, it includes body of individuals. I think it is later on that uh, mm. it, it you know came to notice that uh, when you look at uh, Fund. See, we all talk commercially, oh, we need to, and in fact, the government has restated its resolve to get offshore funds uh, investments into India, right? So, when we talk about funds, we have to understand yeah. how these funds are typically organized. And the reality is, and you know, mm. ultimately, this is how the sector is organized. India can't be saying that, oh, no, no, by the mm. way, you are organized in this way globally, but do different for India. They, are t they tend to be organized yeah. as trusts. Uh, one of the reasons is that, as we know, a lot of institutional money comes into these collect uh, collective vehicles. And the institutional mm. uh, money is typically comfortable with a trust structure. They themselves are trust pension funds. 
endowment funds. So yeah, I don't yeah. think there's any real, you know, uh, uh, opaqueness or there is any desire to avoid tax. And mind you, uh, uh, as India knows, as India is a representative under under the BEPS and OECD guidelines, mm. uh, there is a uh, absolute mm. transparency. Mm. There is nothing which is uh, uh, left opaque, and I don't see what the. Re I mean, and frankly, as I said, this was not even uh, uh, thought through as to oh, we want to do something on offshore trust. This is uh, just a mm. mention now to say oh, okay, but why are you organised as trust? My submission is that I think we should not overcomplicate this. We want those investments. We have said it in so many words in the budget for so many other non-tax measures. Yeah. And this seems to be an unintended yeah. consequence. The earlier it is corrected, the better. Okay, you believe that this is an unintended consequence, uh, uh, though, uh, Mr. Kapadia, you heard the finance minister there saying that uh, uh, at this point she doesn't feel a clarification is warranted, but if one is warranted, uh, she will make it uh, in the floor of the house. And I want to come back again uh, and quote to you what the CBDT member speaking to us on this issue has said. As you are aware, the rate structure of individual HUFs and AOPs is the same, and that's why they are brought together in the finance bill. The new surcharge applies to all three categories. Our understanding of FPI investments is that they normally are a collective vehicle which is in the form of funds, mutual funds, alternate investment funds through LLPs or corporate structures. It seems there are FPIs who are coming through a trust structure which will make them an AOP and hence come under this new surcharge. We are trying to gather facts as to what is the extent of the problem, how are the FPIs operating through a trust structure and once we get the facts we will advise on a way to deal with yeah. this situation. What do you make of that statement from the member CBD? No, I think it's, it's positive because at least there is an acknowledgement that we will review it, we will see it whether it is all encompassing, it is impacting many, many investors or it is just unique to some uh, investors, which I think is a good sign. It is also an acknowledgement of the fact, as I said earlier, that quite frankly this is unintended and uh, this consequence was not something which was uh, expected or planned. And that is an acknowledgement. I think it's a positive one. We should engage and see why there is such a concern to not remove this animally as far as uh, this class of investors are concerned. Yeah. Uh, because uh, as I said, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the whole policy intent has been uh, to levy tax on individuals yeah. in a manner of speaking. Uh, I don't think this was intended for any other yeah. purpose. So, uh, if the clarification is not forthcoming, Mr. Kapadia, and uh, this stands as is in the finance bill, what will be the implications? Because this is not just applicable then to FPIs. Uh, what will be the implications of this? Yeah, so, you know, the simple point is it's about the capital gains tax philosophy which we want to follow as a country. Yes. We rightly, you know, said we will amend the treaties. We won't now give the exemption to foreign uh, investors and level playing field with domestic investors. So far, so good. 10%, you know, on, on long-term uh, listed companies, you know, you could say is 10 high, well, at least it's moderate. Now you're looking at nearly 15%, over 14% mm. with the surcharge. So the only submission is that a 5 crore income in the hands of an individual by all accounts is a very high income. But a 5 crore, you know, really income yeah. under the head business for a fund. Uh, it's not really yeah. uh, a very high level mm. of income by any stretch of uh, imagination. So why are we imposing this kind of right. a surcharge on essentially which is a business which we want to mm. attract? That's the short point. Well, uh, that is uh, uh, the point that has been made to the government, but let's see whether we do see some sort of a clarification being issued. Let me also welcome Kaushik Chatterjee into the conversation. Kaushik, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, uh, you know, a large part of the budget was focused right. on the government's vision and intent uh, for the next five to ten years. Infrastructure, the big one, 100 lakh crore rupees over the next five years. The budget, of course, hasn't laid out the specifics on how they intend to do that. A committee will be set up to examine the various uh, pros and cons. Uh, and a big thrust and focus on public-private partnership. Again, short on specifics, but we're hoping that we will get clarity as we move forward. What to your mind were the big takeaways uh, from Budget 2019, specifically when it comes to things like infrastructure? So, Shirin, um, I think the um, it was more of framework that has been laid, but compared to previous uh, mm. budgets in the past, and I'm saying past for many years, where investments used to happen uh, 
on the basis of the forecast for next year or next couple of years. Here was a, a framework which basically talked about, for example, investments in, in roads, investments in seaports, uh, uh, in infrastructures for one grid for water, power, uh, gas. Yeah. And I think those are being made from the intent to uh, trigger and move towards the vision of that $5 trillion economy. Uh, and messaging to investors right. saying that, look, this country is going to invest heavily in infrastructure. So users of this infrastructure mm. should look at uh, planning for the future. And if this is a commitment that remains uh, to be implemented over the next five years, then I think we are on a very strong runway for investments coming into India and by domestic companies investing into India. Mm. I think this is possibly the intent mm. as the economic survey also talked about it. Uh, you rightly mentioned that uh, there is a, there is a path to demonstrate how this will get deployed, how will we raise the finances, uh, yeah. how would the entire ecosystem be facilitating to make that happen. And I think, um, I mean, companies will, companies and investors will wait to see as to how that roadmap is uh, laid forth and would participate in, in possibly many of these infrastructure projects and the consuming industry projects or the end consumer projects. So I, I see it as uh, a positive. Kashik, you know, but, outside uh, of, uh, uh, I, I think a budget yes, statement it is certainly a statement is a positive, but waiting for the details. That's right. Uh, but one of the other statements of intent that Correct. the budget Absolutely. laid out was Absolutely. with respect to disinvestment. Uh, and that had to do with uh, uh, asset monetization and asset recycling of public sector assets. Now, in our conversations with the Niti Aayog, uh, uh, the Niti Aayog, of course, has been at the forefront of drawing up uh, this roadmap. Uh, you know, the message was very clear. It's very hard to do greenfield investments in India. And so the private sector would be infused getting involved in brown field uh, asset monetization which is what the government is hoping for your your take on that and do you believe that uh, uh, this would be an area where private sector investment would uh, would be unleashed so to speak uh, yeah so I think you know uh, I felt that this is one of the most uh, challenging targets that the government has kept for itself given that it is not a February budget but a, a July budget and therefore there is nine months to go for uh, for actually completing a monetization if it has to be part of the bridge of the government's mathematics to, uh, to bridge the finances. I think uh, again a lot of it would depend on what kind of monetization it is, what is the level of control that will pass or not pass because uh, while there are private investors in all segments uh, who would find value in many of the public sector undertakings but the government uh, has many times said that it is it has no business to be in business I think that needs to be demonstrated yeah. in the process and the uh, method that it will be used whether the control will pass because if control passes the government will also benefit by getting mm -hmm. higher uh, control premium and uh, ensuring that uh, the companies uh, would be more uh, profitable and valuable for the residual stake of the government. So I think uh, we would need to yeah. see the document or the, uh, the policy on which uh, it will be divested and it needs to be big ticket because the sum targeted is very large so yeah. you cannot make uh, smaller divestments or small stake uh, in, the, in the play, you actually need large PSUs with large uh, stake sales with control premiums and I think that is a process which needs to start ASAP and uh, because it's only nine months and these processes take time, government needs to provide the transparency and uh, ensure that the, the future pathway for investors coming in is does not have government interruptions like uh, CAGs and various other stuff. So I think that's that play is still to be seen but uh, yes. it's a very uh, tall ask in my view for the nine months. It can be for two years target it's fine nine for nine months, months yeah. I, I think it's very challenging.
well, a 1.05 lakh crore rupee uh, target uh, on the disinvestment receipt side. That is what the government has laid out in Budget 2019. As Koshik Chatterjee points out, uh, it is going to be a tall task for the government. But uh, Abhizar, let me come to you now on the two other crucial statements that came in from the Finance Minister. 70,000 crore rupee recapitalization plan for banks. This is higher than what the street was expecting. Uh, in line with the CNBC TV18 news break, we had said that it would be more than 50,000 crores and it's coming at 70,000 crores. Uh, the finance minister in an interview to me saying that, look, we decided to go to this uh, number uh, because we didn't want to do something in a half-hearted manner. What is this now going to mean, uh, uh, Abhizar, in your mind as far as PSBs are concerned and their ability to lend and the credit offtake? So I think the providing of capital and ability to lend are two different things and we should differentiate. Uh, one clearly is the fact that is 70,000 adequate? I think it's a better number than what we've seen in the past. In the past, we've always seen numbers like 15 and 18,000 crores. We're now seeing 70,000 crores, which mm -hmm. is a very good number. In our view, the number should be closer to 90,000 crores to meet uh, the Basel III requirements. Okay. But 70,000 is not a bad start. So that's okay. good. Uh, you know, some parts of the press talk about the fact that this capital is going to be used to get a few banks out of the PCA. In my view, the bank should come mm -hmm. out of the PCA on the back of better credit lending. Uh, so I think there is a huge capacity yeah. build uh, that PSU banks need to do. Just the fact that they've got capital, frankly, can easily go down the drain quickly. So it's a good move, uh, but yeah. a lot more needs to be done. A lot more needs to be done, but uh, let me uh, ask you uh, about uh, the plan as far as NBFCs are concerned, Abiza, and whether you believe that this is going to, in any meaningful way, change what we are seeing with respect to NBFCs. Uh, you've also had the Reserve Bank saying that, look, there is enough systemic liquidity, but there's this backstop that has been provided by way of the budget, but it's only for uh, the sound NBFCs. So, do you believe that this is going to, in any meaningful way, address the current challenge that the NBFCs is faced with? So the answer is, uh, well, it depends on what is sound. Uh, so I personally don't mm -hmm. view a sound to be just a better credit rating because anybody who gets a better credit rating, frankly, will be will get the money and does not really need the, uh, the credit enhancement being <coughs> offered by, uh, by the budget. Uh, frankly, first of all, the two parts of this problem, Shirin, part number one is that the total borrowings by the NDFC sector uh, from the banking system is 6 lakh crores and you are trying to provide for 1 lakh crore. So I think the quantum ought to be a little more but right. it's a good start. Uh, second is, I hmm. think uh, that good uh, or sound NBFC should be based on a limited and a controlled yeah. AQR being performed by the RBI and that should be the basis of what is sound hmm. and not credit rating. So that will be effective if not frankly okay. uh, the larger guys will get the money. The larger guys will get the money, but it's uh, not necessarily them that require the money at this point. Mr. Kapadi, I want to come back to you now and talk about uh, and talk about some of the other tax-related measures. And, and one of the measures that uh, uh, has again received uh, uh, some degree of heartburn is the business of income tax and the buyback of shares by listed securities. Uh, now, you know, this was already there in the unlisted space. It's been extended. The finance ministry and the government telling us that uh, you know why should there be an arbitrage, and we've decided to extend it to uh, listed. Uh, shares as well. Uh, your your uh, take on this and the implications? Well, I think that seems to be a fair point because uh, uh, per se there is no need for uh, you know uh, exempting uh, listed companies. There was a feeling rightly or wrongly that uh, there would have been of course some real need for buybacks but also the arbitrage in tax rates was driving it. So I don't think by itself one can quarrel over it. But I just take this opportunity for a minute uh, Shireen to you know to step back. Uh, I think one thing which uh, we noticed uh, is that on the day of the budget uh, when we read the, uh, read the national accounts picture if you like because the 1920 yes. estimates on tax collections are based on the revised estimates yes. in the interim budget. Frankly, and I, yes. I made this statement, yes. uh, you know, to say that for the first time after many years, I have seen very realistic targets for the on uh, for the upcoming yeah. year. But that seems to be a short-lived uh, yes. uh, hope 
because the reality is that the actual collections have been short for example in corporate tax by 50000 yes. crores so what is happening yes. is that for the first time there is a gap between last year's revised estimates and the actual collections and then when we look at the increase right. from actual collections they are really high not that low as it was made out to be hmm. so i think the overall concern would be uh, the familiar concern that you have not increase the rates hmm. uh, uh, largely that is fine except for hmm. the super rich etc you have you know tried to gain more in excise hmm. duty through uh, petrol and diesel hikes uh, but if the expectation is that from the same tax base you will get let us say again another 16 15 to 16% increase in corporate tax collection i don't know where this is going to come from yeah. there is one more yeah. point on the on the on the surcharge for the rich uh from what it looks like is that yes. they are only budgeting no more than 2700 crores uh which is you know, which is really yes. which is really a pittance so i don't know uh, what does one achieve out of that measure if that no, is the I figure no, sir, it's 12,000 crores. In fact, uh, that is the clarification that I got from the secretaries on our budget town hall. It's 12,000 yeah. crores uh, and uh, it comes down to about 8,000 crores uh, if you uh, the minus the 4,000 crores, which is the revenue foregone on, yeah, foregone on account of the yeah. corporate uh, corporate tax right. benefits that have been good. extended that from 250 good. crores to, yeah. 4, 000, uh, to 400 crores. Right. So, it's about, it's about 8,000 crores. Right. Uh, but yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Even though there has been a moderation as far as the tax targets are concerned, uh, we did ask this question to the finance and secretary why have you used the re numbers and not the actual numbers right. uh, they seem to suggest that it it wouldn't make that much of a difference but kashik let me come back to you uh, you know a large part of the budget was also uh, focused on the government's ambition of make in india whether you look at some of the customs duty changes including the one on a 5% customs duty on imported books uh, you know the emphasis seems to be on trying to get people to make in india uh, and the large mega manufacturing zones the accelerated depreciation benefits to be uh, given there. Uh, what do you make of the Make in India vision that's laid out? Yeah, so I think this is a continuation of the policy which the, pre the previous government was uh, talking about. I think they have got a sense of the fact that you cannot do Make in India unless you create uh, manufacturing zones which have a larger ecosystem because Make in India is uh, also about not only specific sectoral policy, it's about the ecosystem, it's mm -hmm. about the infrastructure, logistics, uh, uh, availability of skill, manpower, all of that. So, uh, in a manner of speaking, this budget uh, uh, acknowledges that because the moment you, you look at these kind of pronouncements, then you, you make you make to understand the fact that these are the shortcomings that India has at this point of time. And if Make in India has to become very large, uh, private investment has to become the key anchor, then you have to create the ecosystem and that ecosystem uh, are not um, are not many in India. There are a few pockets where you have auto hubs, mm. auto ancillaries, etc. I think for heavy industries and process mm. industries, those ecosystems are important. Uh, and I think that clusterization of uh, sectors will help. And if you have better logistics and infrastructure facilitated through that one grid approach mm. on power, gas, and water, uh, which are very important for process industry. Yeah. Uh, those will uh, those will enable, but those take time, and I think it will even on the fastest pace, mm -hmm. it will take a couple of years time. So, Kaushik, let me ask you this. You know, while we're talking about the benefits over the next few years, in the short term, if the focus seems to be very clearly on driving investments and private sector investment at that, uh, and that was the theme of the economic survey, and that has been the theme of the budget in spirit, uh, do you believe that in the short term there are enough levers to be able to do that? So, I think in the short term, the public spending on infrastructure will be one trigger and that hopefully will have cascading impact and the quicker that can get uh, initiated or accelerated would be a uh, trigger uh, because end of the day two things are important one is that the, the credit flow in the economy has to uh, start and has to get accelerated because that is the basis on which uh, consumptions will happen investments will happen so the credit start is important whatever been the issues for for public sector banks and nbfc's we got to restore that 
quickly uh, and that will be triggers for larger uh, multiplier effect uh, sectors like automotive and then if you do that then the rest of the economy then starts uh, uh, running in terms of uh, spending money for consumer goods or for construction, real estate and so on. So I think uh, the next couple of uh, months I think there is not much of a change but I think the perception, confidence, trust is all something that needs to come quickly. If that happens I am sure that in the second half of the year we should look at a better numbers and better uh, corporate performance. Well, uh, that is the hope. But Abhizar, let me come to you now. Uh, with the uh, 90,000 crore rupee that's been uh, provisioned by way of the dividend from the Reserve Bank of India, and today we had the RBI board meet, and the uh, governor saying that, look, uh, uh, you know, we still have to uh, uh, to to uh, get to the final number. So 90,000 is what the finance ministry is estimating as dividend from the Reserve Bank. But broadly, uh, the RBI dividend, the non-tax revenue mop-up, also the expectation of what the Jalan committee is recommending may be on the surplus capital of the RBI and how that could flow back to the government. Uh, you know, how, how significant will these triggers be, especially if Mr. Kapadia is a concern on the budget math not adding up uh, is taken into consideration? Uh, I think there are a lot of variables. Uh, Kaushik also mentioned that uh, the 1 lakh crore in divestment may take some time. So we are playing with a lot more numbers, but I think there is a lot more positivity and, and things things which, in, which are within our control. If they can move forward, I think we can do better. Mm. Uh, so for example, you know, you haven't touched on one topic which is the, and hotly debated, is the, uh, is the ability to, uh, of the, the, the budget saying that the government will go and raise uh, government bonds now in foreign currency in overseas markets. I think yeah. that, is, that could open yes. a big tab yeah. which could meet our gaps very significantly. And I don't mean just by the mm. borrowings. Mm. Uh, what it does really is that once you borrow, you actually are starting to create a vibrant corporate bond market. Now, we spoke about 100 lakh okay. crores being budgeted, uh, uh, coming as, uh, as infrastructure spend yeah. which is required. In the past five years, we have only spent 20 lakh crores. Mm. So if you really have to raise mm. that balance 80 lakh crores, it is not the banking system which is going to be able to do that, yeah. but, the, but the corporate bond market system. Yeah. So yeah. I think there is a lot more that can happen because of the triggers that have been put into the budget. One of them being the fact that we borrow, once we borrow yeah. in foreign currency, we actually create a vibrant bond market mm. curve. And with that, we will actually be able to do a copy mm. bond market cost. I personally think that there are hidden gems uh -huh. in this budget, which if used well can be can do a good job. Yes. Not not hidden. They're, they're very clearly articulated <laughs> and you pointed at uh, one of them, Abhizar, the, the, the sovereign bond issue because, uh, you know, that there's opinion on both sides. Uh, the government's view and the finance secretary telling us very clearly that, look, this is an idea that has been debated for several years now, but we believe that this is the right time to take it forward and categorically telling me when I asked him that there's no looking back and he said, no, we don't believe that there's any looking back. Uh, but there are people who believe that this is a door that should remain shut, uh, you know, within the PMEAC or the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council, people who have been part of the Reserve Bank. So uh, what do you believe will have to be balanced uh, you know, as the government looks at the way of structuring the, the bond issue? So, I, I, so first of all, I believe that uh, there is a protectionist thought that you should not do it. I am not of that category and I tell you why. And I do believe that this is the right time for a simple reason that if you look at the bond market today in terms of government bonds, there is less credibility because it seems to be done in a small cocoon, which is the government issues the bonds, the PSU subscribe for it, RBI subscribe for it, 80% is held by PSUs and, uh, and commercial banks, and that's where the market is. Now, if, if you really issue foreign bonds, uh, then what happens is that you are now testing the market for interest rates. And this, uh, given the ample liquidity overseas, is possibly the best time to test it mm -hmm. and then corroborate uh, the existing interest rates that have been charged by, uh, by the government on their bonds. Mm -hmm. Up, uh, paid by the government on the bonds. If mm. that is corroborated once, I think the easiest hanging fruit for us to set up a vibrant bond market yeah. is to make the government bond, more, bond market more credible. The next step will okay. actually be to get the PSUs to sell their cash earning assets into the bond market, corporate assets. And that, okay. I, I, I was looking that. for that in the budget, that whether we are going to have some norm coming that PSU banks should shrink their size that reduces the capital requirements of the 20,000 crore gap okay. can actually be filled there mm. and use those material to supply to the bond market and let the LICs and the PFs and the FPIs right. of the world come and subscribe to it. 
I think if so, this is where I yeah. believe that okay. by opening a small window, we will create a big pool. So I don't think it's a bad idea. Okay. Um, you don't believe that it's a bad idea. It's an idea that uh, uh, the, the time has come to take forward. Mr. Kapadi, I'll give you the final say. Uh, uh, Abhizar believes that that is perhaps one of the big ticket, uh, mm. big ideas in the budget, the sovereign bond issue. Uh, to your mind, what would your big ticket idea be? No, I, I was uh, alluding to the, you know, the challenge on the tax collections. I think uh, India Inc. would be uh, more comfortable if some of the non-tax revenue raising measures of the government are successful and they collect what they are hoping to collect even more than that because you know unfortunately the last quarter the Q4 as I call it uh, for India Inc when it comes to yes. tax targets and uh, tax collections it's, it's never a happy period uh, we can understand that the administration is also under pressure as is the private sector to meet targets yes so I have always said that it's uh, I would I would be happier to see a slightly more conservative uh, tax collection plan and if non-tax revenues and all the right. measures which Abhizar and Kaushik spoke about are successful I think it's actually good for the it's a greater good yeah. for the economy Oh, absolutely. And I don't think there's anyone that will quarrel with that argument. Certainly not Kaushik Chatterjee and the rest of India, Inc. Uh, they, they would hope that this 1.05 lakh crore rupee uh, disinvestment target is met and the government's plans on non-tax revenue mobilization and the sovereign bond issue go through as well. But for this evening, Kaushik Chatterjee, Sudhir Kapadia and Abhizar Divanji, many thanks for joining us on Eye on India with your take on the budget fine print and what it means for the economy. We'll take a break. A lot more coming up. Don't go anywhere. Anyway.